Okay, welcome again. And we're going to do uh, the chapter on renal disease and nutrition. So let me share my screen and let's get to it. Okay, here we go. Okay, so what are we going to learn? We're going to identify the potential causes and consequences of nephrotic syndrome and talk about medical and nutritional therapies. We will discuss the causes and effects of acute kidney injury and chronic kidney disease and go through the differences between those and what kinds of nutritional therapies there are for those conditions. I'm going to talk about kidney stones, uh, nephrolithiasis, and explain how they can be prevented or treated, and explain dialysis. So, you know, what are your kidneys? What do your kidneys do? Your kidneys do a lot more than you think. So they filter your blood and they remove excess fluid and wastes, right? So when you urinate, what you're doing is you're urinating out waste products that your body doesn't need. And not only do, do the kidneys regulate fluid balance, by regulating that, they also regulate the electrolytes in your blood. They also regulate the acid-base balance of your blood. And they also regulate your blood pressure. And they also um, create something called erythropoietin. And erythropoietin is a hormone that goes to your bone marrow that helps your bone marrow produce red blood cells. So if someone is in kidney failure, then they're gonna be anemic just by virtue of the fact that they're in kidney failure. So that's something that you know people should know. And when it comes to the excretion of drugs in your system, all medications, legal or otherwise, um, any substance has to get metabolized either through the liver or through the kidneys. Okay, so alcohol, mostly the liver. Tylenol, mostly the liver. Most other substances, mostly the kidneys. Okay, so it says, you know, it talks about renin. So there's a process in the kidneys called the renin, angiotensin 1, angiotensin 2, aldosterone, antidiuretic hormone system. And that is just this process that occurs in the kidneys with different hormones coming from the adrenal glands uh, that help regulate how much fluid your kidneys decide to hang on to in your body or how much fluid they decide to get rid of. And by doing that, they control your blood pressure. Fun fact, most blood pressure medications interfere with that system. So there are medications called ACE inhibitors, um, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors like lisinopril, it's a very common blood pressure med. It works by interrupting that system and by interrupting it, it makes your body get rid of extra fluid and kind of keeps your blood pressure a little bit lower, but it's not a diuretic. So don't confuse it with that. It's not a water pill. Um, the other thing your kidneys do is they convert vitamin D to an active form in, in your body so that it keeps a balance between how much calcium is in your bones and how much calcium is in your blood. Okay. Uh, there's a real nice slide that shows you a picture of the kidneys. You have two kidneys. They're higher than most people think they are, your flank area right about here. And then each of the kidneys has a ureter, kind of a tube that comes from each kidney that goes down to the urinary bladder, which is just a holding tank for urine. And then when that urinary bladder gets full, then your brain says, uh-oh, have to pee. And then you go pee, right? Um, there's a blood flow system called the portal system that is a very important blood flow system. It's part of the whole circulatory system, but it's very specific as, as in the amount of blood that flows through the kidneys because that's the blood that the kidneys are filtering for wastes and turning that waste into urine, right? And then you excrete it. Uh, there's something called nephrotic syndrome. And it's a syndrome that's associated with the kidneys getting rid of protein. So normally your kidneys job is to hang on to protein and reabsorb it right? But when you have nephrotic syndrome and chronic kidney disease too, for that matter, uh, one of the big issues is that your kidneys will start to excrete protein. So you'll spill protein into your urine. You'll be getting rid of protein that you need. And so people with kidney disease, especially nephrotic syndrome and chronic kidney disease, their protein levels in their blood, albumin will be very low. Um, usually nephrotic syndrome happens because there's been some kind of damage to the glomeruli 
the glomerular apparatus is what that's called. And it is part of the portal system that the blood flows through that takes the waste out. And then the nephrons are the smallest functioning units in the kidneys. And they're the ones that actually are the final say in taking that waste and turning it into urine and sending it out of the kidney to the bladder. Uh, nephrotic syndrome, if it's not treated, will go to chronic kidney disease and eventually the patient will need dialysis, which nobody wants dialysis. Um, and another big cause of nephrotic syndrome is diabetes. I can't say this enough. There are more type two diabetics on dialysis. 95% of dialysis patients have a history of type two diabetes because when type two diabetes is uncontrolled, it's just persistently beating up your kidneys. And so after a while, your kidneys are going to fail. Um, what does a patient look like with nephrotic syndrome? They're gonna be swollen, edematous. Um, their blood lipids, like their cholesterol and their triglycerides are all gonna be elevated. They're gonna have problems with the blood's ability to clot. So they're at risk for bleeding. They're susceptible to infection. Uh, and they always have protein energy malnutrition because of the fact that the kidneys are now just spilling the protein into the urine, they're getting rid of it, not hanging on to any of it. Um, <clears throat> there's another chart here on this slide, slide number 10 that goes through nephrotic syndrome and basically how it happens. So the permeability of the membranes of the glomerular apparatus starts to increase. When that happens, the plasma proteins just they get excreted. They start spilling into the urine and it goes from the kidneys down to the bladder and you're just peeing out any protein that you have, uh, and that's not good. So complications are managed with meds and nutritional therapy sometimes. Medications that are used to treat it are steroids are the big one, anti-inflammatory drugs, which typically steroids like methylprednisolone, you know, prednisone. Um, diuretics and ACE inhibitors can also be used because they um, go right to the kidneys and work on the kidneys. And for real severe cases, immunosuppressants. So shutting down the immune system, believe it or not, helps to kind of give the kidneys a break. This is a very dangerous disorder. Um, people that have this, they're in dire need of protein. And their diet also should be low in saturated fat. They shouldn't have trans fat, cholesterol. All those things should be low because they're already going to have problems with high cholesterol and high lipids and sugars too. Um, if we're giving them diuretics, that are potassium sparing diuretics. In other words, most water pills, furosemide, um, bumetanide, um, they, they deplete potassium. And so the patient will need extra potassium supplements to, to supplement what they're losing. Um, so there's two lab values that we look at when we're looking at kidney function. One is BUN and creatinine. BUN stands for blood urea nitrogen. Um, and that is nitrogenous waste. Right, So we all should have some, a little teeny tiny bit. So a normal lab value for BUN is somewhere around 10 to 20. When you see it higher than that, there's a problem. It could be something simple like dehydration and the BUN will be elevated. <clears throat> the creatinine, on the other hand, is the real indicator of kidney disease. When the creatinine is elevated, a normal creatinine, by the way, is about 0.4 to 1.2. When that gets elevated, then you have to really be afraid that there's some significant damage to the kidneys. And just to keep it in perspective, creatinine level gets to about a six patients on dialysis. They will not be able to live without dialysis. Next topic is acute kidney injury. That went, yes. Yeah. The only time there's an exception is if it's an acute kidney injury versus chronic right? Sometimes let's say a person's in a motor vehicle accident and they sustain trauma actually to that area, to the kidneys. So basically the kidneys just took a beating and sometimes we can use dialysis to give the kidneys a break and they can recover, right? The other example would be somebody who's severely dehydrated. We can then give them rehydration and have them temporarily on dialysis and we can get them off of it. But with chronic kidney disease, once they're going on dialysis, it's graded. So it's, it's one through five. Once you have chronic kidney disease, CKD stage five, the kidneys are basically non-functioning. These patients don't even urinate. Kidneys aren't making any urine. So they, they are on dialysis or on hospice 
or getting a kidney transplant if they're a candidate, right? So with chronic kidney disease, once you're on dialysis, it's a wrap, you know. <clears throat> you can absolutely live with one kidney, but typically with chronic kidney disease, and again, it's mostly type two diabetics that have had these crazy erratic blood sugars. And every time blood sugars are elevated, they are literally, the sugar in the blood is eating away at the capillaries and the nerves in the kidneys, the feet and the legs and the eyes. I mean, it's almost, it's so predictable, it's sad, you know, for people that don't control their diabetes because they're going to wind up in a wheelchair, missing body parts, blind, going to dialysis three days a week with, and their nickname will be Stumpy, which that's funny, but it's not funny because they have one leg, Stumpy, get it. Wake up, pay attention, catch up, right. I, well, I mean, when you need dialysis, dialysis will be paid for. At that point, you're considered permanently disabled. So you're not paying out of pocket. You, I couldn't afford to pay for dialysis. I would have to like sell my house and my clothes. You know what I mean? It's, it is expensive. Um, but once you get to that point, you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna be eligible for Medicaid, you know, more than likely permanent, permanently disabled because you can't work, can't do anything. A person on dialysis, here's their life. They go to dialysis three days a week and it's either Monday, Wednesday, Friday or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. And the days they go to dialysis, dialysis takes four to six hours and they're exhausted. And saying the word exhausted doesn't even really help to, to grace how tired they are. They're exhausted. So the three days they go to dialysis, those days are shot. The day after dialysis, they're exhausted. So those days are shot. So these patients have one day Right. And depending on their schedule, you know, it, it, usually a Sunday that they have a break and a decent day. And it's still not a good day because all the problems that go along with this chronic, chronic kidney failure. So they have something called uremic frost and azotemia. So on the days that they don't go to dialysis, their kidneys aren't working. And so whatever they're taking in is just staying in their body. So the toxic waste is in their blood. Right. And it will ooze out of their pores. If you want to see something, it's, it's cool to look at, but it's horrible. Just Google image uremic frost. And it looks like the person has been out in an ice storm, right? They have this frost and it's everywhere from head to toe. And it itches. It itches. And it's an itch that you cannot scratch because it's the toxins coming from inside through the pores out. You, you, there's nothing. There's nothing to make it stop. It's horrible. As you can see, I'm not a big fan of, like if I needed dialysis, I would either get a kidney or get some morphine. And that'd be all she wrote. Um, so this chart talks about the reasons for acute kidney injury. Now with an acute injury, the difference between acute and chronic, acute is something with a quick onset, right? It happens fast and oftentimes we can fix it. When something is chronic, it's progressive and degenerative. So it only gets worse over time. Right. So with an acute kidney injury, maybe you have a kidney stone that's blocking a ureter or is jammed up in one of the, you know, the glomeruli in the kidney. So the kidney may be not working temporarily, but if we get that stone out, flush the kidney, then the kidney will come back to life. In other words, right. So obstructions, um, dehydration, the biggest thing that you see in hospitals, especially with older folks, is they get dehydrated so quickly right? They forget to drink. They don't have that thirst instinct the way we do. Um, and they're also usually they're retired. They're not moving around as much. So they don't get thirsty. They literally forget to drink. And so some slight dehydration can really cause an acute kidney injury, but then we'll give them IV fluids and we can, you know, get them back to normal again. A um, couple words to know. So oliguria is a decreased amount of urine. And so that means anything less than 400 milliliters, give or take a day is considered oliguria. So the minimum amount of urine output before we say you're in trouble, you need dialysis is 30 mils an hour. Anything that's less than that, your, your kidneys are not functioning. Um, anuria means when you see A or AN in front of the word, it means without. Anuria means they're not urinating at all. And typically people on dialysis do not urinate because their kidneys aren't working, they're not making any urine, right? Uremia, I always talked about that, and uremic frost, right? Google image that, it's scary. How do we treat it? Well, usually it's 
with acute kidney injury, like I said, it's general hydration, IV fluids, um, sometimes drug therapy because they have other issues like hyperkalemia, potassium levels will go up really high, or if they're on diuretics, potassium levels can go down really low. Potassium is the queen mother of all your electrolytes because if your potassium ain't right, you're going to have a heart attack. When you think potassium, you think muscle and potassium controls the muscle tone in your body <clears throat> and your heart around your heart is the myocardium. That's a muscle that makes your heart beat. Potassium high or low, heart attack is around the corner. Um, nutritional therapy for these folks, we have to give them extra protein because they aren't spilling it. We're getting rid of it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Restore the fluid balance, replace the electrolytes, and then sometimes dialysis. Now, chronic kidney disease, again, number one reason, diabetes. Diabetes, diabetes, diabetes. There are also other reasons for chronic kidney disease that can be congenital, hereditary diseases, um, can be something inflammatory like an infection, glomerular nephritis is one, <clears throat> immunological, or hypertension. <clears throat> this is the other one that people don't realize. Hypertension is called the silent killer. Why? Because there are no symptoms. When people say, oh, I know when my blood pressure is high, I get a headache or I get a nosebleed, then your blood pressure has been very high for very long. And that's not good. And every time your blood pressure is sustained high like that, it's beating up the kidneys. So number one is diabetes mellitus, the reason for, for chronic kidney disease. And number two is hypertension that's not been diagnosed or controlled. And then end-stage renal disease, which they call ESRD, that's stage five of chronic kidney disease. That means that basically, like I said earlier, your kidneys are done. They've shut down, they're not doing anything, and you have to be on dialysis. And the people that are on dialysis, not only is their life horrible because of the schedule, but if I were to show you a medication list of people on dialysis, you've seen them, they're as long as your arm. They're, um, because they've got to take phosphate binders, there are a million things that they have to take. And then we have this drug called midadrine that's going to be PRN in case they bottom out because when they go to dialysis, sometimes their blood pressure will drop precipitously because we're pulling off in one day with the machine what their kidneys should have done over the course of two or three days. Mm -hmm. So when the machine is dialyzing them and pulling the toxins out of their blood, they lose weight, literally fluid weight. So they may go in weighing, say, 150. They're going to come out, say, weighing 140. And it's even sometimes a greater loss than that. But if they pull off too much fluid too fast, the patient's blood pressure will bottom out. And then we give the midadrine to jack it back up. So you got a pill for your pressure being too low, a pill for your pressure being too high. It's, it's, it's a horrible life. I can't say that enough. Uh, let's see. We already talked about the malnutrition. Um, with chronic kidney disease, the only thing we can do is hopefully slow the progression of it, right? There's not a cure. Uh, we can't, we can't stop it, but we can hopefully if the patient's compliant, she sneezed on the truth, God bless you. And we can prevent it from getting worse, you know, and, and they usually need erythropoietin, like a drug called epigen, which is given by injection that helps to stimulate red blood cell production. Cause they're going to be anemic when their kidneys are failing, um, blood pressure medications, diuretics, water pills. They're going to need um, PRN orders for things like a bicarbonate because the acid-base balance in the blood gets thrown off from the kidney failure and cholesterol-lowering drugs. The list goes on and on. It's, it's, it's a nightmare. Um, and their diet, whew, I mean, they can't have too much potassium. Potassium is limited. We need a lot of protein. So it's a very specific diet that they have to be. We, they can't have too much sodium. Usually it's it used to be 2000 milligrams, but now most people agree that 1500 milligrams of sodium a day is eating too much. And I live by that and I don't have kidney failure. Like sodium, it will kill you. And vitamin and mineral supplementation as well. So they, their whole life revolves around their medical treatment, basically is what I'm saying, right? They, and they're on fluid restrictions because if they drink too much, their kidneys aren't working. And so they're not gonna get rid of the excess fluid so they're going to be really blown up with edema fluid when they go to their next dialysis session. And then we're going to have to pull that fluid off of them during dialysis. And then they're going to bottom. It's, it's just this vicious circle of events. It's yeah. Right. I mean, that's, that's my opinion does not reflect the opinion of Atlantic Cape community college, nor any of its affiliates, my personal opinion. 
I always give you the, you know, the disclaimer. Um, kidney transplants, if you're a candidate or if somebody's willing to give you a kidney and they're a match, right? I knew a guy in Florida, his girlfriend was a match. Amazing. And she gave him a kidney. Yeah. You know, so, um, but the demand for transplant organs is always higher than what we have available. Right. And, and also just, you know, I'm an organ donor, right? Um, although I plan on beating up my organs before I die. So I don't know if there's going to be anything left, but they're welcome to it. Uh, the point I'm making is I've heard people say things like, um, oh, I don't want to be an organ donor because if there's an accident, they won't save me. No, no, that, that, that's crazy. And that's not true. Right. Um, we save you. If we can save you, if, if you are brain dead, that's a different story, you know, but um, if you can, if, if you're at all, you know, amenable to it, be an organ donor because you could help save somebody's life. I'm a bone marrow donor too. Yeah. Yeah. I've been on the bone marrow donor list for 20 years and I've never gotten cold. Isn't that shocking? Yeah. No. Nope. Well, you know, they broke the mold when they made me. So nobody, nobody's a match for me. Say, say that again, I'm sorry. So what, you know? The reason I got on the, it is, it's painful. The only reason I got on the list was that my daughter had a friend whose mother in her thirties was dying of cancer. And so I went and got tested to see, you know, if I was a match, cause I would have gladly, she was only you know, young in her early thirties. She wound up dying, which was, yeah. So, you know, I, I would happily give some bone marrow if it could save somebody's life. That's, I'm fine with that. Um, so we talked about transplants and once you get a transplant and it doesn't matter what organ, whether it's a kidney, if it's a lung, if it's a heart, you will be on immunosuppressant drugs for the rest of your life because your body can perceive that new organ as a threat. So even though it's a match, you know, with your blood type and all that good stuff, it still doesn't belong to you originally. And so your immune system will see it as a threat and will attack it and destroy it. So you don't want your immune system to kill your brand new kidney. So you're gonna be immunosuppressed through medications the rest of your life, which means you're always gonna to have to be, you know, if you go in crowds, you have to wear a mask. You're not allowed to eat uncooked or undercooked food, right? They're called neutropenic precautions. Um, you know, you, no fresh fruit, fruits, no fresh vegetables. They have to be cooked. Uh, no fresh flowers, no live plants. I mean, it really, but you got a kidney. So that's, that's not that big of a price to pay, I guess, you know, when you look at that. Um, and then we'll talk about kidney stones. Kidney stones are not fun. So anybody that's had them can tell you that. Um, I've treated many patients in the ER with kidney stones and my husband had kidney stones and that was fun. Um, I'm kidding, it wasn't fun. So people are, they tend to be genetically predisposed to kidney stones. Kidney stones are made up of usually one of two things. They're either calcium oxalate or uric acid, right? They're the two most common substances that create kidney stones. So for people that have predisposed genetic tendencies to develop them, when they get one, what we try to do is we try to get them to pass the stone if it's small enough to pass. And we use a little, you know, like a colander that you would use for pasta. We use one of them, but it's more like a screen so we can catch the stone, send it to the lab, see what it's made of, and then tell them, hey, in the future, don't eat this stuff, right? And then you may not get another stone. So calcium oxalate is not calcium. People always think it's calcium. It is things like chocolate, dark chocolate, which is delicious. But, uh, and uric acid, which is also the substance that causes gout, if you've ever heard of gout, Uric acid comes from purine and purine rich foods are all the delicious foods like steak and lobster. They used to call gout the rich man's disease because people that ate very rich diets tended to get gout. So if you drink a lot of good beer, you eat a lot of steak, red meat, um, shellfish, but the good stuff, like I said, like lobster and scallops, that those foods have a lot of purine in them. So if your problem is uric acid, you would be told to avoid those foods. And so the stones, basically what happens is when these, these substances are in the kidneys, they, and especially if the kidneys are a little on the dry side. So for people that don't drink enough water, and by the way, enough water for an adult that's healthy is about 2,500 to 3,500 milliliters a day. 
So a bottle of water is about 500. So minimally you should be drinking five of these a day. How many people are drinking five a day? Wow, you, I, wow, that's, that's good. That's really good because most of the time people, I can't drink five. You need, I mean, you really need to go for that. As long as you don't have, you know, like congestive heart failure or a problem that would, you know, prevent you from drinking that because that fluid helps to keep your kidneys going, right? Keeps you hydrated and it helps to prevent stones from forming too, right? Because a drier kidney will, will initiate, if there's any of those proteins in that kidney, it can crystallize and form that. And a little teeny tiny little stone, the pain that's associated with a kidney stone, I've watched people with kidney stones and it didn't look like they were having a good time. Not at all, you know? Um, you get, they get intermittent pain. It's usually starts in the flank area up in here, but it can travel around the side. It can go down to the genitals, right? The tip of the penis is what I get from men all the time when they have kidney stones. Oh my God, it hurts. And it does. Because as that stone is traveling, it's going, <laughs> you know, against the inner lining of the kidney, the ureter. Once it gets in the bladder, they get a little relief because the bladder's bigger, you know? But then when the bladder fills up with urine and the stone is floating in there and then they start to urinate and the stone moves through the urethra, ouch, ouch. There's some cool pictures of kidney stones there. Um, okay. Fluid intake, everything that I already talked about. And then dialysis. So just so you know, there are two types of dialysis. There's hemodialysis. The, when you see heme, you think blood, right? So hemodialysis is where the patient goes to the facility and they have an arteriovenous fistula, bless you, or graft in their arm. Um, and you can actually see it. It's like this bulging thing. What we do is we go in surgically and we connect an artery and a vein. We do an anastomosis between those two things. And when they go to dialysis, they will stick in two needles, one in the artery, one in the vein, and your blood is literally coming out of your body, going through the machine, because the machine is taking the place of your kidney, and then putting the blood back in your body again. Then there's peritoneal dialysis, and that, I don't know how anybody does, but peritoneal dialysis is where instead of going to a facility, you can do it at home. People usually do it at night, but if you're doing it at home and at night, you're gonna do this every night. We will surgically implant in the lower part of the abdomen, uh, like a little shunt, right? And every night at bedtime, they get this big bag of liquid called dialysate. And it's got tubing, you attach it to gravity, like hanging on an IV pole, sterile technique attached to that shunt, that all that fluid flows into the peritoneal cavity. There's a peritoneal membrane that we use as a filter, right? And so all that fluid goes in, it sits there, it's called dwell time, it sits in there for, Time can vary, you know, 45 minutes, an hour. And then we get an empty bag and attach that and let it hang low. And all that fluid drains out. So it accomplishes the same thing as hemodialysis, but you're literally doing this all night, all night. But most people will sleep, you know, while, while it's going on. So either way, dialysis, kidney failure is not fun, okay? Not fun. Uh, I already talked about that. There's a nice picture of somebody next to a dialysis machine called a dialyzer. Um, and then peritoneal dialysis, I just explained that. And there's some, there's some really good pictures in this PowerPoint, I will say that. And that's the end of the kidneys. So basically with the kidneys, you're thinking they need protein and they have to limit potassium and sodium. They need protein, they have to limit potassium and sodium and f limit fluid, right? So. All right, let me stop the share and we will check out. Peace out.